everybody to join uh, uh, the last innovation talk of uh, uh, this academic year. Uh, I remember this innovation talk is organized in partnership with Philip Morris. And today we are very pleased to have uh, as our guest speaker, Dr. Essa Maria Paola Chiesi of Chiesi Pharmaceutica, uh, who will present uh, um, what uh, uh, the pharma industry, in particular Chiesi Pharmaceutica, is doing in the sustainability uh, field. Uh, before to hand over uh, the, a brief introduction of who is uh, Chiesi Pharmaceutica to Carmelinda Ferrero and Roberta Marzi, who are two students of the Executive uh, Master in Sustainability and Business Innovation. I uh, remember to all of you to keep uh, your camera on, if possible, during the presentation, but uh, the mic off. If you want to ask any question, please feel you free to do this. Possibly raise the hands and I will manage the handover and try to foster as much as possible the interaction. I will leave then the floor to Carmelinda and Roberta and then to Dr. Maria Paola Chiesi. Thanks to everybody to join this innovation talk. Thank you, Francesco. So today we have the honor of welcoming Mrs. Maria Paola Chiesi, Director of Corporate Social Responsibility Chiesi Group. Maria Paola Chiesi holds a degree in Medicinal, Chemistry and Pharmacological Sciences and a Master in Business Administration. Since 1995, she works at Chiesi Pharmaceutici SPA, having covered various roles mainly in international marketing and strategic planning. Since uh, 2010, Maria Paola is coordinator of Chiesi Foundation, expression of Chiesi corporate social responsibility. Thank you, Carmelinda. Then uh, Mrs. Maria Paola Chiesi is the director of shared value sustainability department since 2015. In this role, she has the task of identifying objectives and targets, as well as guidelines for social responsibility activities, both at corporate and branch level. The main objective of the department is to determine a positive impact on society and environment, evaluating social performance and implementing improvement action. Uh, and uh, now let's welcome Mrs. Maria Paola Chiesi. Well, thank you very much for this invitation and thank you for the nice introduction. I will now try to share my screen. And so hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'm going to uh, describe you is our approach to sustainability. Uh, as Chiesi, uh, which is, as you mentioned, a pharmaceutical company, which has a turnover of around 2 billion euros, 6,000 employees in 29, now 30 countries all over the world. Uh, by the way, 52% of our employees are female, so we have a perfect uh, balance in terms of gender mix. And what I'm going to present you is also our uh, B Corp journey. So I will describe a little bit what a B Corp uh, company is, what a benefit uh, society comp company is, and why and how we uh, became a, a certified B Corp. Um, I don't want to make a monologue, so please uh, raise your hand and ask any question you you might have. Um, so I will start just uh, by uh, giving um, a, a very brief uh, context. Uh, the situation we are uh, is definitely a very critical one. It's not only because of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, it's because we are witnessing uh, two major crises that never before the humanity had to, uh, to face. 
Uh, the first one is the climate change. And the second one is the inequality crisis. So we now have a number of uh, subjects external to the industrial world that um, ask the, the companies, the industry sector, to pay attention to sustainability in a very different way. So uh, we have uh, institutions, we have um, civil movements, we have investors that ask companies uh, to play a role, a social role in the society, uh, to have a, a purpose and to have a positive impact. And um, I think it's also very important to remind that the European Green Deal uh, is now the strategy of the European Union. So the climate crisis is at the center of the policy making and of the strategy of development of the European Union. So sooner or later, companies will be asked to play their part here. And this will be a heavy part since uh, the industrial sector is the major uh, polluter in the world. And uh, it's within this sector that we have the vast majority of CO2 emissions. Um, and a very important, uh, a very important date that maybe a few remember or a few have marked is September 25th of 2015. It's the date in which the United Nations issued the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda uh, 2030, which is a global call to action for peace, prosperity, and justice uh, for the planet and all its inhabitants. But if we want to really um, resume and condense the 17 sustainable goals, uh, we may easily uh, understand that they refer again to the two major crises I was mentioning before, the climate change and the uh, inequality crisis. Uh, this, the SDGs though, uh, add a very important aspect that is uh, the goal uh, number 17, that is the partnerships for the goal. So it means that uh, nobody can achieve these goals all alone. Institutions are not sufficient to re reach the goals. Everybody, every part of the society, every stakeholder must have a role in achieving the goals. And, and then another important point is that, as Professor Jeffrey Sachs says, the SDGs are not a manual a card. You cannot choose and pick uh, what you like. You have to demonstrate the contribution to uh, each single uh, goal because we will achieve the overarching goal of prosperity and peace only if we achieve all the 17 goals uh, all together and not one at a time. So this is very important to notice because um, if you look at the uh, sustainability reports of many companies, they choose and, and we did the same, they choose and pick. Uh, what the goals, uh, the goals that they prefer. In our case, we selected some of the goals that we think we have uh, the, the possibility to contribute the most, but at the same time, we introduced a, um, a new tool that is called SDG Action Manager that allows companies to measure the contribution uh, to each single goal of the 17 of the um, Agenda 2030. And I think this tool is very, very important. 
Um, so traditionally, um, uh, we may think that um, uh, we can tackle uh, prosperity and economic development uh, in two ways. One is uh, the business value, so the for-profit sector, and the other one is the social value, so the non-profit sector. And so in a way there was traditionally an antithesis between two, these two sectors. So companies typically produce economic value, but they don't care for the social impact and uh, nonprofit organizations only care for social value, but they not necessarily generate economic value. So the point is, is there a third way? Is there an alternative to this dichotomy? And uh, we believe that uh, the alternative are the companies for benefit. So those companies that uh, bring forward a concept that is called shared value. Shared value, I'm sure you are familiar with this term, uh, was uh, identified by Michael Porter in a seminal, seminal work uh, that was published in 2006 on Harvard Business Review. And shared value means that a company generates value for all the stakeholders and not only for the shareholders. So, and by, by generating a value for the society, the company is also gaining competitive advantage. So this uh, concept of shared value is in a way perfectly interpreted by the benefit corporations. So what are benefit corporations? Uh, the benefit corporations are a legal form, a res quite recent uh, legal form that was introduced in Italy in 2016. Uh, that is present also in the United States. It was originated from the United States and nowadays um, is available also in France, uh, thanks to a recent law that is called Loi Pacte that introduced the form of Société à Mission. Um, so, as I said, this is a legal form. So Chiesi Pharmaceutici, for example, decided to become a benefit corporation according to both the US and the Italian law. So we are Chiesi Pharmaceutici SPA SB, where SB stands for Società Benefit. Uh, which is the name that we have in Italy. So what does it mean? It means that uh, these companies that decide to become benefit corporations have also uh, not only, uh, let's say, an objective of generating economic value, but also an objective of generating benefit for the collectivity, benefit for the society. So Casey decided to become a benefit corporation in uh, 2018, at the end of 2018. And this means that we changed our bylaws, introducing four objectives um, of benefit value for the society. Um, so <laughs> to be clear, it doesn't mean that our bylaw before contained uh, sentences like maximizing the profit or things like this, not at all. Simply our bylaws, um, the purpose of the company in our bylaw was to um, develop, uh, produce and commercialize medicinal, medicinal products. So it was very, let's say technical, okay. It is of course, something uh, very uh, consistent that a medicinal product has also a social value since uh, uh, it should uh, treat um, uh, or cure a, a disease. So the social value in a pharmaceutical industry should be intrinsic, um, but it, this is not necessarily so. And in any case, 
it's very important to focus on the stakeholders rather than on the products. So if you want to create a benefit for the society, you have to focus on the stakeholders. So these are the four um, benefit objectives that we have introduced in our Balos since uh, 2018 um, that I can um, uh, very rapidly read. Um, sustainability and innovation of processes and practices. Uh, improve of the quality of life of patients and people. And of course, this is our mission, improve the quality of life of patients. Uh, development of local communities and uh, promote a conscious and sustainable way of doing business. So this is a different way of doing business if you want. It's a different philosophy for a company. And not only we want to um, nurture this kind of culture uh, within our company, but we want to promote it also externally uh, in a dialogue, in a collaborative dialogue with other um, uh, industries, with other companies and uh, with all the stakeholders. Um, in parallel with these, um, with these, uh, uh, journey uh, becoming a, a benefit corporate corporation we also decided to measure our impact and we then were awarded the b corp certification so what is a b corp a certified b corp company um, b corp companies are companies that uh, undergo a very thorough and rigorous assessment uh, that is called B impact assessment, where of course B stands for benefit, um, uh, which is an assessment that measures uh, the impact and the performance uh, on the society and on the environment of a given company that also evaluates the public transparency and the legal accountability of such a company. Um, the certification is administered by a third party organization, which is a nonprofit organization based in the US that is called B-Lab. Uh, currently, this assessment is considered the most rigorous and scientific, in a way, uh, assessment of uh, social and environmental performance. Uh, it's very um, exhaustive. Uh, it's not like many of the SDG, ES, sorry, ESG indexes that you can find where again, you can use them as a menu a la carte. In this case, it's a comprehensive uh, assessment that um, analyzes the entire company. It is estimated that B-Lab knows that uh, more than 100,000 companies nowadays uh, have undergone the B impact assessment, but only three of them, 3% 3 of them achieve the score that is required to obtain their certification. So the assessment yields um, a score that, um, um, is ranges on a scale from zero to 200 points. Uh, the so-called break, break even is considered 80 points. So below 80, a company is considered extractive. So it absorbs resources from the society while above 80, a company is considered regenerative. So it regenerates the land, it regenerates the resources, it regenerates the society. And as I said, only 3% of companies that have undergone the BIA so far have achieved the, uh, the certification. Still, there are 
more than uh, 3,600 companies nowadays that are certified B Corp in, over, in, all, in all the world. So 74 countries, 150 industries. And by the way, Casey was the, is the largest so far pharmaceutical company to having obtained the certification. Uh, which means a lot of things. First of all, being Casey, a um, mid-sized company, it means that nowadays um, there are still few big companies that have achieved this certification, which, which is surely a difficult certification to achieve. Um, the biggest company that I'm aware of that has achieved the certification is Danone, which is, uh, as you may know, a dairy French company, a, a dairy multinational uh, industry, but its uh, headquarters is based in France. However, Danone has decided to um, achieve certification one company, one affiliate at a time. That's why we are still the biggest European B Corp. Uh, and Danone said that uh, they will reach uh, the certification as a group uh, by the year 2025. Uh, the second um, aspect is that since we are currently the largest pharmaceutical group, uh, it implies that um, um, the B Corp certification was new to the pharmaceutical sector. So we were a sort of guinea pig. Uh, well, that's our, our business in, okay, in any way. Um, so uh, we had to uh, also explain to Belab a number of aspects that are typical of the uh, pharmaceutical sector. And I'm sure we were a little bit penalized by the fact that uh, we were um, among the very first pharmaceutical companies to uh, approach the certification. But um, all in all, uh, the score is not really important. Uh, the certification per se is not really important. What it is really important is what you learn from the certification. So I just want to show you um, what you obtain from the certification. So you can see on the right hand side, um, what we call the uh, benefit impact profile of a company. Uh, so the impact profile uh, comes out of the assessment. The assessment uh, analyzes uh, different areas. So the governance, mission and engagement, uh, people from an HR perspective. So for example, um, minimum living wage, these kind of things. Uh, people from a, an health, safety and well-being perspective. And of course, this includes also um, the, uh, the very vast field of diversity and inclusion. Uh, what a company does for the community development, uh, this includes, of course, and this is extremely important, uh, the supply chain. So the point is that uh, a company cannot be considered uh, independent from its supply chain, because it could be very easy to, you know, produce, uh, to sell very clean products while you have a very dirty supply chain, or you have uh, perfect respect of human rights in your companies, but this is not the case for your suppliers. So um, the, B Corp, the B impact assessment analyzes also what you are doing as a company to engage your suppliers in uh, having a positive impact on the society and the environment. Uh, another aspect, of course, of investigation of the B impact assessment is the environment. Uh, so the impact the company has on the environment. 
And uh, last but not least, the impact it, ha it has on the customers. In our case, of course, the customers are the patients. So you can see that the inner shape uh, was our input profile in uh, 2017. So, so when we started our, our journey to become a B Corp. And you can see that there were areas that where we were quite uh, brilliant, uh, where we had a positive impact, uh, but other areas where we had a lot of space for room for improvement. In particular, uh, this was the case of the environment. Not because we uh, were um, a particularly dirty com company, because we were already uh, certified ISO 14000 and so on, and also consider that the norms that regulate the environmental impact of medicinal products are very stringent, more stringent than for any other industrial sector. But uh, the point was that we had, we had not focused the environment as a, a major stakeholder. Okay, so environment was not high in our in priority in our strategic considerations and this was perfectly uh, uh, remarked by the B impact assessment another area as you can see that we were where we were quite lacking was mission and engagement but this uh, was simply due to the fact that um, uh, we gave for granted information that we thought was absolutely well known. For example, uh, we didn't report in our uh, website the composition of our uh, board of directors. And this is a very important uh, tool in terms of transparency, a very important uh, piece of information in terms of transparency. Uh, we never recognize that um, the fact that we didn't publish it was uh, a non-transparent transparent behavior. So th this is because it is very well known that the, the company Chiesi is held by a family, that is the Chiesi family, and the board members are the members of the family. But this was simply not evident from our website. Our biographies were not published. So there was a degree of non-transparency that was not wanted, but it simply came from our uh, naivete, if I may say so. So as you can see, the shape that is in the middle is the shape that we achieved um, uh, in 2019 when we got the certification. So as you can see, uh, mission, the, the area mission and engagement was immediately um, brought to uh, the extreme of, uh, of what it is possible in terms of uh, positive impact because we implemented uh, all these transparency uh, uh, behaviors that were required. Uh, and so what was very important from uh, the B impact assessment was to obtain an improvement plan. So as I said, the certification per se is not important. What is important is uh, the improvement plan you receive uh, and what you implement uh, subsequently. So as you can see, between 2017 and 2019, we implemented uh, uh, quite, quite a number of uh, activities and projects that allowed us to completely change the shape of our impact, while the external shape is uh, what uh, we aim to achieve by the year 2022 when we will have the new certification because uh, the recertification happens 
every uh, three years. So we think this um, tool is very important because it's a, a tool to measure, to benchmark, but also to improve. And there are very few tools that have such a power. Um, so now I will give you a sense of what we have done practically uh, to improve our impact. Um, which is in a way witnessed by uh, the certification we obtained. Um, one aspect that is very important, as I mentioned before, is transparency. So we, we published our first uh, sustainability report in 2015, so well before, uh, but um, as many uh, sustainability reports nowadays are compiled, they tend to um, show only the good side of a company. Uh, they do not show the struggles of a company to achieve a, pot a positive impact. So we think this is uh, really um, a missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity for the society because what we see very often is something very close to greenwashing, I would say. But it's a missed opportunity for the company because it misses uh, the possibility really to analyze uh, and to check and and scrutinize all its uh, practices and processes to understand the externalities, to understand the impact of what a company does uh, on, on the society and the environment. So we try to uh, have a sustainability report that is the most transparent as possible. Of course, it is based on our uh, B impact assessment, so on our certification. It is compliant with the GRI standards, the Global Reporting Initiative standards. But the point is that the Global Reporting Initiative standards, they simply, they are very important. I, I'm sure you are familiar with them. Um, I, I hope so. Uh, they are. Uh, a very important reporting standards across all industries. They are important because they uh, offer a number of standards. So uh, they tell you exactly what you have to measure and how you have to express that measure. So for example, if you want to measure your um, CO2 emissions, they tell you exactly how you can convert the use of electricity into CO2 equivalents, for example. So they are very important uh, because they give you uh, a standard uh, for expressing um, your impact, but they are blind in terms of impact. So if, you, if your emissions are 40,000 tons or 400, thousand tons, the GRIs, they don't say anything about that. They only ask you uh, to describe the management approach uh, to this uh, material topic. So we didn't want to focus only on that. So we are GRI compliant, but we express, we, uh, uh, we integrated in our report um, a framework that was suggested again by Professor Jeffrey Sachs uh, that implies four dimensions. So you, we describe our impact on uh, products and patients, on the processes, the global value chain, which includes, of course, the suppliers and in terms of corporate citizenship. Uh, as I mentioned, being a benefit corporation, we also have to um, produce yearly an impact report, which 
states the uh, uh, impact objectives that the company has for the following year. And uh, then the following year, you have to give information on your uh, degree of achievement of those um, goals. So the impact report as a benefit corporation is completely integrated in our sustainability report. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we have integrated also this new tool that is called SDG Action Manager that was developed in a joint uh, partnership between uh, B-Lab and the United Nations to analyze um, and quantify uh, the impact of a company on each single SDG. Um, another very important aspect of the sustainability report is that it offers uh, companies the possibility to make, uh, to perform a materiality analysis. And if the materiality analysis is done properly, this could become really a strategic tool in uh, establishing the key priorities of a company and also an effective risk management tool. So when I, I, I guess you are familiar with the materiality analysis concept. Um, I asked Professor Mora to, to confirm, otherwise I can give you a very brief flavor of what it is, but essentially- yeah, most of them should be. Sorry? Most of them should be aware. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So the materiality analysis analyzes the material topics. So, so what it is important for a company from two perspectives. One is the stakeholders' perspectives, and the other is the impact of the company. So it is often uh, misrepresented, I think, because very often you, you see materiality matrices, matrices where you see the importance of a given uh, material topic for the stakeholders and the importance assigned by the company. But this is not what the materiality analysis should state. It should state what the impact of the company is on that materiality topic. So if you use it properly, it can be really a very valuable tool for uh, strategic making decisions in terms of priorities, but also uh, to manage uh, effectively the risk. Um, and this is another a very um, general um, um, uh, collection of uh, projects or programs that we are carrying forward. Uh, to achieve our positive impact objectives. So I, I, it, it would be really too long to, to, uh, um, to tell you in practice was what the company is doing, but sometimes companies, other companies are, um, have difficulties to understand what in practice means to become a B Corp. So uh, this was uh, surely a very interesting cultural development for our company. Uh, the, the concept of shared value means that in any activity you do, in any, in any process you do, in any practice, in any product you make, you have to understand at the same time, both the business value and the social value. So these two concepts should not, should never be separate. They should always come together. And at the beginning, it was not so easy because people could easily see the business value and could, could easily see the social value but rarely they could see the two in the same process or in the same product. So we had to invest a lot in the culture of the company, even though our uh, employees were uh, adhered enthusiastically to the idea 
of becoming a B Corp, uh, because I think this was very consistent with our tradition uh, and with our values. But then when we uh, went to the practical terms, uh, sometimes they were so, um, um, they had this kind of habit of separating the two things, okay? Business is business and social activities are social activities. So uh, we went through um, um, an important process of reanalyzing all the processes and the practices and the products of the company. We developed a sustainability strategic plan uh, that uh, was the, in a way organized uh, using the dimensions, the dimensions um, provided by the B impact assessment. And then we defined the objectives that we wanted to achieve, making sure that every time we could easily in, uh, understand which was both the business value and the social value of a given initiative, of a given project, of a given product, of a given process. So one of the first things we did was to decide to become carbon neutral by 2035. Uh, why 2035? Because at that time when we made this kind of decision, we had no idea what it meant. So 2035 will be the year of the 100th anniversary of the company. And that's how we picked up that number. Now we have completed our um, CO2 emissions inventory. And so we can say that we will achieve carbon neutrality for scope one and two by the year 2030. And the scope three by the year 2035. I hope you know the concept of scope one and scope two and scope three for the CO2 emissions. But just to simplify this, this concept, scope one are the direct emissions of a company. Scope two are the emissions linked to energy. Scope three are the emissions that are not in control of a company. So that are external to the company. So for example, business travel. So when you fly, uh, the CO2 emissions of the, of the airplane are scope three. Um, so this, was, this is a major program uh, of the company that has a lot of implication. Uh, it entails some costs, but I can say that uh, the savings outweigh the costs. And uh, we started this program well before the European Green Deal, and we are very happy that we are really on track uh, to achieve our objectives and uh, to anticipate, in a way, the legislation that followed. And another very important aspect, as I mentioned before, is the supply chain. So you have to make sure that you involve all your supply chain uh, in your uh, search for a positive impact. Otherwise, uh, you could be a very, let's say, very good citizen as a company, but you may have a very bad supply chain. So you could put all your dirty things in the supply chain in another country, for example. Um, so we developed together with our uh, strategic suppliers, a code of conduct for suppliers that we uh, called code of interdependence. And that um, is now extended to all the suppliers. So if a supplier wants to be uh, a vendor of Chiesi, they have to subscribe this code of conduct. 
for the time being, it's not so stringent that obliges everybody to become carbon neutral, but for sure in the future, this will come. Because if we want to uh, fully achieve carbon neutrality, we have to oblige also our supply chain to become carbon neutral. So this will come. Um, in terms of um, patients, uh, this was maybe the area where it was so difficult to understand uh, what a different positive impact we could have because it is intrinsic, as I said before, to the pharmaceutical industry to think that we generate a positive impact for the patients simply because we produce pharmaceutical products. But the point is that one thing is to produce a product, to think of a molecule, of a mechanism of action. Another thing is to listen to the patient's experience. So we decided to invest in our knowledge, in developing a knowledge, a, a, an understanding, uh, a full listening process of the patients. And this is what is uh, written here in the center, uh, the Fireball Project, pioneering the patient mindset, uh, really to put on ourselves in the patient's shoes to understand uh, their experience, to understand the fact that they are normal people be besides being patients having some disease, but they live uh, a normal life in most cases, uh, hopefully. And so um, the disease is a part of their life, but it's not the life they live. So uh, this change changes completely the perspectives of the pharmaceutical company and opens up also a number of opportunities of services that we have never, or products that we have never thought about before. Um, then um, I will conclude uh, just by mentioning the aspect of diversity and, um, and inclu inclusion, which is a major project a major program that we have started in the company, not because we had particular uh, problems of diversity and inclusions, but simply because again, this was not focused by the company as a key priority. But in any case, evidently, our performance was quite good as very recently we were ranked number 10 among all the European companies by the Financial Times uh, in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, but we have um, uh, taken major steps to improve our um, DNI program and particularly to scrutinize and analyze our performance in terms of, uh, well, not uh, gender mix, because as I already said, we are, have 22, 52% uh, of women, but in terms of gender pay gap and in terms, more importantly, of gender leadership gap. I say more importantly, because in terms of gender pay gap, we are more virtuous than uh, the national average, even if, uh, of course, we want to close this gap as soon as possible. But where we have to work more is on the leadership gap, because this entails, of course, a work on all the system of career paths. We have to ensure when, that when we have candidates for a given position, we have a, a balanced mix in terms of gender of the candidates, candidates short list. And this is rarely the case. So we have to invest on the uh, training and developing program to ensure that uh, we have women with uh, enough um, training and experiences to be able to, uh, to have the ambition uh, for a given uh, positioning position, particularly in the top management. I hope this uh, was clear enough. 
Um, last uh, slide is about what we do externally to our company. So uh, we have, uh, I just mentioned um, three activities that we are doing in partnership with others, uh, but there are many uh, more than those. Uh, the Kizi Foundation is a nonprofit organization that is devoted to improve access and quality of neonatal care in low income countries. And so we work particularly in um, West Africa, in West Sub Saharan Africa, uh, where neonatal death uh, rate is extremely high and uh, where there is quite a lack of international programs uh, to um, establish uh, good standards for uh, neonatal care, particularly in uh, referral hospitals. Uh, we have recently founded um, a new foundation, a new nonprofit organization that is called Regenerative Society Foundation that uh, brings forward the concepts of a regenerative economy uh, and so new business models for climate action and global happiness. And we have done this in partnership with other companies and organizations such as the Illy Foundation, uh, Davines, which is a, a cosmetic company, a B Corp, uh, also here in Parma, uh, Muti, which is um, a quite famous um, company that produces tomato sauce, uh, Banca Mediolanum, and uh, we also had as a partner uh, the Foundation for the Sustainable Development, Fondazione per lo Sviluppo Sostenibile, and uh, Nativa, which is uh, the first B Corp in Italy uh, that uh, acts also as the Italian branch of B Lab. And finally, the last uh, the initiative that we created is Kilometro Verde Parma, which is um, a, a reforestry consortium. Uh, it's a private consortium, non-profit organization for the reforestation of the Parma province. So Parma, as you may know, um, uh, is, is located in, the, uh, in a valley. Um, as Bologna, by the way, which is one of the most polluted um, location in the entire world, for sure in Europe. So this consortium has the ambition to contribute to the fight to climate change by planting new trees, which is part of, you know, a more global strategy to achieve carbon neutrality that is made of avoidance, um, substitution, reduction, and subtraction. So the Kilometro Verde Parma, it takes care of the subtraction uh, part. So this is the end of my presentation, but of course, as, as I said, I'm very open to any question or cu curiosity you may have on the company or on maybe more in, interestingly uh, on the process that we went through. Okay, <clears throat> so thanks very much for this very insightful presentation uh, who really uh, shed a, a, a light on the feasibility because you know the, the sense talking with businesses uh, is that uh, sustainability is you said during your presentation is more a green wash, you know, business is something else. Yeah. So here it was very tangible. Um, I invite everybody who has a question to come forward. I have a, a first question is, I guess the decision uh, by the board of uh, Casey Pharmaceutica to move towards uh, uh, um, this uh, sustainability track and the adoption of uh, all the standards uh, and the new uh, benefit corporation um, statute um, uh, was not so linear 
despite the fact that uh, it's a, a, a company owned by a family. So what, what uh, was the, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the dynamics, the positive dynamics of all the different uh, members uh, uh, you know, looking also at the past of your of your company, I, I guess you know you um, mentioning uh, the carbon neutrality. You said we anticipated the legislation, you know, that is coming into force more and more. And if I look at the history of Chiesi, definitely uh, uh, the inhalator. Uh, you know, you were able to uh, take advantage. To the fact that uh, some legislation for the product changed and immediately you know everybody in the pharmaceutical uh, arena uh, rushed uh, into looking for alternatives and you were there you know happy so this uh, i think uh, you know i do not want to suggest but definitely you know this uh, history positive history from the past definitely helped to take such a you know forward looking uh, perspective uh, you know, whatever is uh, the industry, you know, pharmaceutical, as you said, is not the biggest polluter uh, uh, in terms of CO2, but definitely, you know, the path you have uh, taken is definitely important. So if you have some comments and also provide to our audience some guidelines, you know, recently, you know, we launched uh, a new mastery in sustainability and uh, especially in uh, transition because we are leaving all uh, everybody in a transition period and during uh, the executive uh, interviews um, for candidates for the executive you know most of them are working in companies where sustainability climate change is not even considered yeah? but they personally feel is important so you know providing some guidelines could help you know when uh, 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 our audience will come back to work, you know, to really drive positiveness towards uh, uh, the uh, achievements of those goals. Okay, so I start from the the first question. Uh, it was not at all difficult to uh, to propose this uh, journey to uh, our board. Uh, because, as I said, probably we had a tradition that was so consistent and coherent. Um, let's say that in 2015, so first of, of all, our journey started with the creation of the Kizi Foundation uh, that became operative in the year 2010. And the reason why we created the Kizi Foundation was because we were we are still uh, the global leader in in uh, in the neonatal field because we uh, 30 years ago we developed a product for uh, respiratory distress in syndrome of premature babies so babies that cannot and they, they lack um, a protein that is called surfactant. And so uh, you have to give an exogenous surfactant. Um, so we were extremely successful in that very niche market, but very important because in 30 years, we saved the life of 5 million babies. Okay, so there, there was certain, certainly also a tradition of products that had an impact. But in, in, in that year, we decided to create a foundation because we said we have such an experience in such a, a knowledge in this field, we also feel the responsibility in that field because the, we are the leader, we are the only one. If we don't do it, nobody else will do it. And so we decided to create the foundation to transfer means and knowledge to uh, low income countries in neonatal care. And this was maybe the, um, uh, the, the first seed 
that led us to the B Corp certification. Uh, because um, when working for the foundation, one of the main problems we had was to measure the impact. So Kizi Foundation is purely philanthropic enterprise, okay? The point is, it's very easy to give money, very easy in philanthropic initiatives. But then are you sure that you are having a positive impact? And are you sure that you are having the best impact for the money you are putting in the, this initiative? So we started to uh, struggle with the measurement of the impact and we deepen a lot this kind of understanding and knowledge of the measurement of impact. So in 2015, we said, okay, we do a lot of philanthropic activities, not only the Casey Foundation, but also on the, in the local community, both in Parma and in all our affiliates. Let's organize these activities with a strategic approach. So we created a department that was, uh, as I said, my department, because before I was head of strategic planning. So I left strategic planning. And before that, I was head of international marketing. So I left strategic planning and I became the director of the CSR department. So Casey, uh, corporate social responsibility, again, G CSR is in a way separate from business, okay? It's, it's still conceived as something in between uh, philanthropy and uh, responsibility. And so, um, so we decided to give a strategic approach to that. And again, we said, okay, we have to measure the impact of this. And we started to measure the impact of this CSR activity. And then we said, well, well, but why don't we measure the impact of the entire company? And that's where we started to look for uh, assessments that could give us um, uh, a flavor at least, if not a measure of the impact, positive or negative of the entire company. And then we were uh, blessed by, enlightened by a meeting with a company that is called Patagonia. I'm sure you know Patagonia is an out, outdoor outfit uh, company uh, based in California. And they are maybe the pioneer of the B Corps. Uh, nowadays they call them the activist company and so they introduced us to the concept of B Corp and to the B impact assessment. So at that point was so easy to propose to the board, to propose to the top management to become a certified B Corp. But I have to say that first of all, we went to our middle management. We proposed this to our middle management. It was embraced with such an enthusiastic uh, approach by the middle management that there was no way that the board or the top management could say no. Okay, so what we gained from this, we gained in reality um, much more uh, than what we uh, expanded because um, people were, and are enthusiastic. Uh, the sense of belongings uh, to the company has incredibly improved. Uh, talent retention and attraction uh, is improved. Um, we have reviewed all the processes. Uh, it means that people have put a lot of creativity. So there was a diffused creativity in the company to review all the processes and practices, to find ways to reduce energy, to the reduce resources, to uh, feel empathy with the patients and so on. So creativity, it, I never, never in a million of years expected that creativity would be a byproduct 
of the B Corp certification, frankly. And last but not least, we saved a lot of money because we became more efficient, both in the processes and in the energy consumption. So if I have to give a suggestion for the other executives, really uh, be sure when you go back to your company that is, this is uh, the way forward, that if you do this kind of fight, you will be a winner. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, from the audience, uh, I, any question, remarks uh, of this very inspirational talk, uh, you know, uh, this is the purpose of these innovation talks as well, you know, not to be narrowed down. Uh, anyone? May I ask a question? Yeah, Ornella, go ahead. Uh, so I know that, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. It's very, very interesting. And all your projects are very interesting and useful as well. So my question is, as far as I know, um, it's very difficult or not easy for a pharmaceutical company to make advertising. So my question is, in which way, if you do, if it is important for you, you communicate to your patient, to customers, what you're doing? Because we know that nowadays uh, there's always this, uh, let's say, bad image of pharmaceutical companies. So how do you do that? How do you communicate? Okay, so uh, advertising is not possible for products uh, in the pharmaceutical sectors if the products are um, prescription products. You can advertise for over-the-counter products. Okay, so... If you buy a, a product uh, in the pharmacy and you do not need a prescription, uh, that is an over-the-counter product. And for those products, you can advertise. Different thing is in the United States where you can have direct-to-consumer advertisement also for prescri prescription products, but this, this is not allowed in Europe. Um, well, we decided for a while not to um, communicate too much, too directly, uh, our becoming a B Corp, because we were so immersed in uh, our reviewing of the processes, in our improvement plan, uh, in our creation of a new culture inside the company. So we communicated through our sustainability report uh, to our um, uh, in a way, uh, presence at the B Corp movement activities, but that was it. Um, then when we, re more recently, um, we felt uh, in a way bolder, uh, we felt that we had completely integrated this concept of sustainability inside the company and inside the culture of the company, we decided to communicate directly to our customers. And so recently, uh, our, um, our affiliates are, uh, have, been engaged, uh, have uh, been engaged in uh, uh, communicating to the doctors, for example, uh, what a B Corp is. Yeah, which is not easy at all because they couldn't care less. Okay, so uh, we have to transmit the value of becoming a B Corp, the value for the society, the value for them of dealing with a B Corp company. And so our affiliates decided to promote uh, being a B Corp as if it, as if it were a product. So now they go to the doctors, they don't talk about the prescription products, they talk about being a B Corp. Also to create a culture in the public. And for this reason, we also decided to become a very active ambassador of the B Corp movement. So very recently, you might have seen my face, uh, for example, uh, on some newspapers and so on. Not that I'm very happy of that because I'm a very reserved person. I don't like the spotlight at all. 
but um, we feel that it is very important that the biggest uh, European B Corp uh, acts as ambassador of the B Corp values. Uh, and so uh, we will join also other companies uh, in this, as we did uh, in the past summer with a campaign uh, that appeared on in Italy that was called Unlock the Chain, the change that was made by um, uh, the Italian B Corp movement, or uh, in reply to uh, the business roundtable um, advertising on um, several um, newspapers last year, a campaign that was war called Let's Work Together. So we are becoming more and more active to um, communicate to the external world what a B Corp is, what companies should do to become B Corps. Um, we also made uh, an important initiative just before the start of the lockdown uh, with the journalists uh, to train the journalists about B Corp and about B sustainability in general. Um, so this is a, an important point that we are only now starting to address. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, it's 11 past two, so I would say uh, there is uh, room for a, another couple of questions from the floor. Anyone who want to uh, you know, ask or make a comment? Uh, I have a question, Alessandro. Yes. Um, thank you, first of all, uh, Teresa Chiesi, for, for your very interesting speech. Uh, I have this question. When we, when we do compare uh, large organizations uh, with uh, uh, SMEs, we usually read on journal articles that uh, mm, large organizations apparently uh, do more in uh, sustainability related topics compared to small companies. However, you just said that when, we, when it turns to measuring stuff, uh, actually you are the largest uh, company that has been assessed against the B Corp and reached the standard. That is quite challenging. Uh, so you proposed us a quite different uh, perspective that to my point of view uh, is very interesting. And uh, uh, the part of the question is, on the one hand, how can we uh, allow uh, companies that actually do implement sustainability practices to emerge? Uh, and on the other hand, how can we support small companies that maybe do not have enough resources to effectively communicate the practices that you already implemented uh, to rise up in this context? Thank you. Yeah, th this is not an easy, an easy question at all. Um, first of all, I want to uh, clarify that we are not the biggest company that was assessed. We are the biggest company in Europe that passed the score. Um, so there are much bigger companies that I'm aware of that are um, uh, using the B impact assessment but they were not able so far to reach the score. Um, I'm sure that the biggest companies, big, big companies are those that uh, for various reasons are more active in terms of sustainability. And the main reason maybe is because the consumers or the investors are asking them to do so. So maybe it's not something that came uh, naturally from uh, the heart of the company, but for sure they have to do it because uh, consumers and investors are now asking so. Um, at the same time, uh, the B Corp movement is really made of small companies that have enlightened entrepreneurs in a way, enlightened leaders and uh, like Patagonia, I would say, you know? So uh, they represent 
in a way, a niche, an elite of leaders. And they do not represent at all um, the word of the SMEs. Uh, to my, I don't have a great, a great knowledge of SMEs, but to my understanding, because of different working tables I'm, I'm at with, uh, with this, this kind of companies, the degree of knowledge of uh, what sustainability is in SMEs is very, very low. Uh, even the concept of climate change is low. Even the concept of CO2 emission is, uh, is low. Uh, and this is amazing. Uh, it's very easy to talk about SDGs. Everybody now, it's very fashionable to talk about sustainability and SDGs. But then when we go to the, you know, nitty gritty implications of the operations, there is a huge degree of absence of knowledge, particularly in the SMEs. So I think there is a huge responsibility of the universities, of the academy to improve this knowledge, for example, uh, to work with, um, for example, the associations, the industry association like Confindustria, for example, to improve this, this degree of knowledge, be, but not only because this is the right thing to do, it's also because we need to defend the competitivity of our industrial uh, system, which is based on SMEs, differently from many other countries in Europe. So I really fear when the Green Deal with all its uh, 15 strategies will become low because our SMEs will be not ready for it because our culture is still lagging behind in this respect. So other countries uh, will be advantaged. So I think Academy has really a huge importance here in bringing forward this kind of knowledge and culture. Thanks. Uh, I have Thank to say much. that Bologna Business School, you know, was among the first in Europe, uh, you know, in 2011, you know, to define uh, uh, this part. And uh, uh, definitely I share with you this. Um, there is room for, I'd say, a last question. And I choose from uh, the chat. So Sabrina Correale, if you can put your uh, uh, screen and mic on, you can ask your question, you are more than welcome. And then uh, I would uh, thank you for uh, the time and very insightful and inspirational, inspirational uh, uh, talk, uh, um, Dr. Risa Maria Paola Chiesi. Sabrina? Uh, yes, hello everybody. Yes. So thanks a lot for picking out my question. And thanks a lot for your uh, uh, really interesting presentation. So I would like to, um, to ask something about uh, diversity. And my question is, from your point of view, um, what could be and what would be the barriers we have to work on uh, in our country uh, for our young women to really feel able uh, to enter uh, leading roles in, uh, especially in science? So, what would be your your proposal according to our uh, national situation? Because for for example, according to my personal experience in, in the pharmaceutical industry, I, I really uh, experienced uh, bias um, regarding uh, gender uh, topics. So um, it would be very interesting for me to, to understand your position and maybe your proposal. Okay, so um, I don't know about uh, the other companies, but in general, in the pharmaceutical industry, um, there is a quite good uh, gender mix uh, because typically in um, the scientific roles, um, scientists are by vast majority uh, female. Um, so typically there is a good gender mix, uh, but then mm, this is true until a certain level of seniority and, and um, career. Um, 
in the in the top management, we still have quite a lack of gender balance, even though we have some examples like the CEO of um, GlaxoSmithKline, for example, that is, I guess, the second company in the world, pharmaceutical company in the world, that is a, um, a woman. I think we have to um, we have to start at least by um, um, having a compulsory disclosure of uh, the gender mix of uh, the top management of companies. Uh, the so-called quota rosa was were not sufficient. Uh, we have to better prepare our women to uh, to achieve those um, those roles. Uh, it's not that they are not prepared from a technical point of view, but I think, and this is maybe my bias, but I think women do not fight enough for those roles, do not fight enough those biases. And I've seen this many times, men can obtain uh, an increase in salary simply because they ask it maybe aggressively, this is not the typical behavior of a woman. I'm generalizing, of course. Uh, so we have uh, to prepare our women to um, really um, be ambitious enough for top management roles and at least oblige the companies to make a uh, full disclosure of the gender mix of the company in general and the top management in particular. Maybe this wouldn't be enough, but we have to start somewhere. I think it's important that if we create the demand for women in the top management roles, then the offer will, will follow if I may can make this kind of metaphor. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, to our guest speaker for really, you know, uh, inspirational, insightful, and also practical uh, um, uh, stories. And uh, to all of you who attended uh, this innovation talk, I remember um, to all of you that this is the last uh, innovation talk of, of, uh, uh, for this uh, um, year. There will be a new series of innovation talk uh, organized by Bologna Business School starting from uh, spring and you will be uh, accordingly uh, informed when they will be uh, finalized. Thanks again for uh, our speaker and your attendance and uh, I wish you all a, a good day. Thanks. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you very bye. much. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. You. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.